Welcome back. Today we're going to be discussing the digestive system. The digestive system is made up of a long tube that runs from the oral cavity to the anus. There are places where the tube is enlarged and there are other accessory organs that help the digestive system with its function. You can see that the digestive tract organs are on the right side and include the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and anus. We also have these accessory organs, the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas that help us out. There are six processes in digestion. Some of these processes happen only in one place. For example, ingestion. Food enters the system only in the oral cavity. Some of the other processes happen in several different places along the tube. Digestion can be either mechanical digestion or chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion is the breaking of food into smaller pieces. This does not change the chemical makeup of the food. Chemical digestion breaks the bonds between the molecules and atoms. This does change the chemical makeup of the food. We require enzymes to help us with chemical digestion. Digestion starts in the mouth, continues in the stomach and small intestine. Movement also happens throughout the tube. This involves the coordinated contraction of the smooth muscles in the walls of the tube, squeezing food through the system. This movement is called peristalsis. Absorption is when the food bro is broken down into small enough pieces that we can move it across the walls of the tube, either into the blood or lymph system. Absorption starts in the stomach, but the majority of absorption happens in the small intestine. Some also happens in the large intestine. Elimination only happens in one place, and that is the anus. This is where waste that is not absorbed will be removed from the body. There are four layers to the tube. The lumen is the hollow space in the middle of the tube. The inner layer is the mucosa. This is made of epithelium and creates a smooth surface for food to move through. The next layer is the submucosa. This is made out of connective tissue and it contains blood vessels, nerves, and lymph. The muscularis is the next layer and contains two different layers of smooth muscle. One runs circularly around the tube and the other runs longitudinally along the tube. These can contract forming the squeeze-pull action used for peristalsis and mixing of food. This layer also enlarges to form the sphincters that can control movement through the tube. The outer layer is called the serosa, and this forms the visceral peritoneum that helps anchor the tube and hold it in place. The start of the digestive system is the mouth. The processes that happen in the mouth are ingestion, mechanical and chemical digestion, and movement. The teeth help with mechanical digestion, tearing food into smaller pieces. The tongue helps with movement, pushing the food and saliva to the back of the throat. The hard palate is at the top of the mouth behind the teeth. This is formed by the fusion of bones. The soft palate is further back in the mouth and it is a muscular layer that separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. The soft palate extends to the uvula, which is the flap of skin that hangs at the back of the throat. This structure flips up during swallowing to prevent food from entering the nasal cavity. The portion of the tooth above the gum line is called the crown, and the portion below the gum line is called the root. The crown has a layer of enamel which protects the underlying dentin from decay. Blood vessels supply the tissues of the tooth with nutrients. Dental caries are cavities. These occur when bacteria live in the mouth and form colonies. The bacteria produce acidic waste, which eats through the enamel covering the crown. If the cavity gets deep enough, it can cause inflammation of the dentin and cause pressure on the nerves that supply the tooth, causing pain. Fluoride treatments strengthen the enamel, making it more resistant to erosion. Bacterial colonies can cause inflammation of the gums, known as gingivitis. If the gingivitis and colonization gets bad enough, it can lead to inflammation of the periodontal membrane, 
causing periodontitis. This leads to a gradual loss of bone from the socket and loosening of the ligaments that hold the tooth in place. The best way to prevent gingivitis and periodontitis is to limit sugars and brush and floss regularly. Within the mouth are three salivary glands that are accessory organs for the tooth. These produce a watery fluid that contains mucus, water, and salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is an enzyme that begins the process of chemical digestion in the mouth. It digests starch. Also included in saliva is an antimicrobial protein called lysozyme. The mouth and nasal cavity lead to the pharynx, a hollow space at the back of the throat. This space is shared by the digestive and respiratory system. The pharynx can be subdivided into three spaces. The space posterior to the nasal cavity is called the nasopharynx. The space posterior to the oral cavity is called the oropharynx. And the space posterior to the larynx, or voice box, is the laryngopharynx. We'll talk more about the laryngopharynx in the respiratory system. During swallowing, the tongue pushes the food and saliva to the back of the throat. The uvula lifts to block the nasopharynx and the larynx moves up under the epiglottis to block off the entry to the larynx. If you feel the front of your throat when you swallow, you can feel the larynx moving up. The food has no other option but to move down into the esophagus. Peristalsis moves the food through the esophagus. The esophagus is only a tube that carries food from the base of the laryngopharynx to the stomach. The only process that happens here is movement. At the base of the esophagus, the food passes through the lower esophageal sphincter. A sphincter is a ring of muscle that contracts to keep food either into or out of a section of the tube. The lower esophageal sphincter is supposed to relax, allow food through it, and close tightly behind the food during swallowing. However, sometimes this sphincter doesn't close properly and the acidic stomach contents can splash out into the esophagus. This causes heartburn. The stomach is a storage tank for food as it waits to enter the small intestine. While the food waits, it is smooshed around and undergoes mechanical and chemical digestion. The lower esophageal sphincter guards the opening to the stomach and another sphincter, called the pyloric sphincter, guards the exit from the stomach. The pyloric sphincter only allows a small amount of material to exit the stomach at a time. Very little absorption happens in the stomach. Only water and things that are lipid soluble, such as alcohol, can be absorbed through here. Most of the function of the stomach is in the storage of food and mechanical digestion. In addition to the circular and longitudinal layers in the muscularis, the stomach also has a third layer of muscle, an oblique layer. This helps the stomach to contract, increasing its ability to mechanically digest food into smaller pieces. The walls of the stomach also contain deep folds called rugae to allow for expansion after a large meal. The mucosa of the stomach invaginates into deep pits called gastric pits. Within the gastric pits are gastric glands, which produce gastric juice. Gastric juice is made up of an enzyme called pepsin, which digests protein, hydrochloric acid, and mucus. The hydrochloric acid causes the stomach to be very acidic with a pH of about 2. This is protective for us, as it helps kill off bacteria present in food. Pepsin and HCl will chemically digest the food in the stomach. When food is mis mixed with gastric juice, it forms a very acidic, soupy material called chyme. The pyloric sphincter makes sure that only about 5 milliliters of chyme enters the small intestine at a time. The small intestine is small in diameter, not length. It is about 6 meters or 18 feet long. There are three regions, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The small intestine is where chemical digestion is completed, and the majority of absorption of nutrients happens here. Digestive enzymes that digest all of the major macromolecules are found here. Protease breaks down proteins, amylase breaks down starch and sugars, 
and lipase breaks down fats. Although the intestine does produce some enzymes, the majority of enzymes are produced by the pancreas, an accessory organ that lies in the curve of the duodenum. The accessory organs of the digestive system include the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. The liver is the largest organ in the body and has many different functions. It detoxifies blood and stores glycogen, iron, and vitamins. It also produces the plasma proteins in the blood. In regards to the digestive system, the liver produces bile, which is then sent to the gallbladder for storage. Bile is released when you eat a meal containing fats. The pancreas is important in producing bicarbonate, which neutralizes the acidic chyme from the stomach. It also produces the majority of digestive enzymes in the system. Bile, bicarbonate, and digestive enzymes are all released into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. In addition to chemical digestion, the small intestine is also where most nutrients are absorbed. Several modifications to the wall of the small intestine increase the surface area available for absorption by 600 times. The mucosa forms folds called villi. These villi are about one millimeter long and each villi contains a capillary bed and a lacteal. Nutrients are absorbed through and around the cells of the villi into the capillaries and lacteals. Each cell of the villi also contains microvilli, little extensions of the plasma membrane where digestive enzymes are secreted. Nutrients are absorbed across the walls of the villi into either a blood capillary or a lacteal. Remember, the lacteals are part of the lymph system, which returns excess interstitial fluid to the circulatory system. In the first panel, you can see that carbohydrates are broken down by amylase and then absorbed through the mucosa cells into a blood capillary. In the second panel, proteins are chemically digested down into amino acids by proteases and then are also absorbed through the mucosa cells into the blood capillaries. However, in the third panel, fats are digested by lipase enzymes. In order to do this, fats require bile. Remember that the body is an aqueous environment and we all know that fat and water do not mix. Fats will always try to form big globules with other fats. Bile, produced by the liver and stored in the gallbladder, will surround the small fat droplets and prevents them from sticking back together. This process is called emulsification. Bile holds the droplets apart, increasing the surface area available for lipase to chemically digest the fat. Once broken into fatty acids and monoglycerides, they will be absorbed into a lacteal. The digestive system requires regulation. You don't want your stomach producing acid and pepsin all the time, only when you are about to eat. The secretions of the digestive system are regulated by the nervous system and by digestive hormones. A hormone is a chemical that is released into the bloodstream and acts on a target cell. When you think about food, or smell food, or even look at food, the parasympathetic nervous system stimulates the stomach to produce the hormone gastrin. Gastrin is represented by the blue arrows. Gastrin enters the bloodstream and acts on the gastric glands of the stomach to increase gastric juice production. Cells in the wall of the duodenum also produce two hormones, cholecystokinin and secretin. Secretin is produced in response to the presence of acid in the duodenum. Remember that chyme released from the pyloric sphincter is very acidic with a pH of 2. When this hits the duodenum, it causes the release of secretin, the green arrow. Secretin enters the bloodstream and stimulates the pancreas to release pancreatic enzymes. Cholecystokinin is also produced by intestinal cells and is stimulated by the presence of fat in the duodenum. When you eat a high-fat meal, cholecystokinin is released, which stimulates contraction of the gallbladder, which releases bile required for lipase to do its chemical digestion. The large intestine is large in diameter, but not length. 
It runs from the ileocecal valve at the end of the small intestine to the anus. It contains five sections, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, where the colon makes an S shape going to the back of the body, and the rectum. The rectum opens at the anus, where elimination occurs. The large intestine does not secrete any enzymes, and the majority absorption has already occurred by the time the food gets here. The primary function of the large intestine is to absorb water. This allows it to concentrate the remaining waste into feces. Absorption of too much water in the large intestine can result in constipation, whereas absorption of not enough water in the large intestine results in diarrhea. The large intestine is also colonized by a large variety of bacteria. These bacteria help us break down indigestible material and produce vitamins needed by our bodies. The large intestine absorbs these vitamins along with the water. The rectum serves as a storage area for feces. Stretch receptors in the walls of the rectum are activated when material builds up, extending the walls. This sends signals to the nervous system. The nervous system causes contraction of the muscularis layer of the rectum and relaxation of the sphincters at the anus. We can control the timing of elimination because the external anal sphincters are made of skeletal muscle, which is under our voluntary control. That's it for today. See you in class.